welcome in everybody so every single day i get a whole bunch of questions around how risky is bitcoin and what should i do is it deflationary will it be banned yada 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 so i decided to put together a video that addresses all of your concerns and basically again as usual this is edutainment not investment advice and this is about math the future of money so very quickly these are the top six Bitcoin risks that you are all concerned about as we go forward. So risk of government bans, Bitcoin is not a currency, there's not enough Bitcoin, Bitcoin is deflationary, Bitcoin is not a productive asset, so it has no value, and Bitcoin will be replaced by another currency, it's scarcity is an illusion, all that type of stuff. Same things, I've heard it all, I hear it so many times, so I decided to make a quick video to give you all some peace of mind. So, as usual, let's start with the banning. And banning is kind of a little bit in the news today because we have our little friend Erdogan from Turkey. Of course, Turkey decided to ban Bitcoin. And as I've covered in previous videos, what are the common symptoms of a country that bans Bitcoin? It's always corruption, it's always inflation, and it's always an autocracy. And of course, Turkey hits all the tick boxes in that particular category. They have all the symptoms. Obviously, they're suffering from very bad inflation. The autocrat has no control over his people. And he doesn't want them fleeing to crypto because then he'll have even less control. So it's a problem. And uh, of course, the place is very, very corrupt. So I heard from a few friends of mine uh, in Turkey and they are very concerned. And they should be. Anyway, they are the common symptoms. Let's talk a little bit about uh, why these countries ban. Obviously, the number one reason is a perceived threat to the monetary systems. It was the same fellow, by the way, a few weeks ago, begged the people of Turkey to sell their gold to prop up the banking system. Wouldn't you like that in a leader for somebody to say, hey, would you mind selling your car and your TV and give us the cash so you can prop up the banking system? Sound good? Yeah, I don't think so. The other reason, of course, as I mentioned before, they want to build their own CBDC. In fact, Brazil are looking to do that themselves right now as well. So this is a mad, mad dash to try prop up the fiat currencies in many of these countries. So what are you going to do? Obviously, my thought regarding all of this is, again, based on the messages I got from people that I know in Turkey this morning, is all about, oh my God, how do I convert my fiat into Bitcoin? How do I convert my gold into Bitcoin? How do I get out of the country? That type of thing. So there's going to be huge brain drain. Uh, pe people are going to be creative. And of course, because Bitcoin is decentralized, it's easy to evade. And that is the beauty. So sorry for the people out there. And this is just one of the many dominoes that will fall. Thank God the US is now pro Bitcoin under the current administration, which is a good thing. And many forward-thinking countries will have to be. You can't deny this at all. So it's coming. But there will be other countries that will follow down the path of Turkey. And this is just a big, glaring advertisement for Bitcoin, in my opinion. So, yeah, governments can't ban it. They can try. They just make it more popular when they do that. Okay, second issue. Bitcoin is not a currency. Okay, let's dig into this a little bit. Um, many of you know the greater fool theory and a lot of people like the Peter Schiffs of the world that hate Bitcoin, they always use this by saying, oh, I hope there's another fool that will buy it at a much higher price, thinking that Bitcoin is a bubble and silly people find sillier people to buy the Bitcoin. So you're going to hear a lot of that. And But again, that doesn't apply to this particular asset class at all, but no stretch of the imagination. So let's look at some global currencies. So the US has 15% of global GDP, which is about one seventh of the GDP of planet Earth, which coincidentally is the same as the European Union. They both have the same GDP. But in terms of global currency, the US dollar manages about 44% of all currency transactions around the world. Now, what's interesting to note here is if you look at the Chinese yuan and Hong Kong dollar, those two combined make up 4%. And of course, the digital yuan wants to be the new reserve currency 
of the world and replace the US dollar. But again, what this will do will drive more movement because you know the 44% that the US dollar has, that's only gonna shrink over time. I expect it to be 40%, 35%, 30% and, and downwards because the digital one will become more prominent and the Chinese will demand it for trade with other countries. And of course, China is the manufacturing house of most of the world, so they will succeed. But again, that will promote things like Bitcoin as we go forward. Now let's dig down into the British pound. And the reason we do that is because Bitcoin just overtook the British pound as the sixth largest currency in the world. Yoohoo for Bitcoin. But the real message here is sterling was the primary reserve currency of the world for most of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Can you imagine that? And now Bitcoin is bigger than what was the reserve currency. So the message there is all currency dies. And that takes us to the next point. So if it is not a currency, what is it? Now let's look at the user base. So the UK population is about 66 million people in 2019. And the Bitcoin addresses with a non-zero balance today is about 37.83 million. So you could argue that the number of Bitcoin users is over half of the number of sterling users which was the sixth biggest currency in the world until very recently when Bitcoin overtook it. So that's one aspect to look at. Now, if it is not a currency, what is it? So successful currencies, as you all know and you've all heard before, have six key attributes. Scarcity, divisibility, utility, transportability, durability, and counterfeitability, which is a strange word. But Bitcoin checks all those boxes perfectly. So is it or is it not a currency? So, and some people say, well, it's not a currency, it's not an asset, false. Even the IRS classifies it as a property. So that debunks that theory as well. Now, perhaps not being a currency is a good thing. So, because we all know currencies go to zero over time and that's just a fact of life. Now, the US dollar has lost 96% of its value since 1950. That's shocking. So just think about that for a second. And Bitcoin so far has proven to be the ultimate store of value, far better than anything else in the history of humanity. So again, another feather in the cap for Bitcoin. So net net, all money dies. The conclusion here from my side is you may not even want to be a currency, even though Bitcoin has all the attributes of a currency, it doesn't really make sense. And you don't want to be something that ultimately dies anyway. So great book, by the way, if you haven't read it. So a little plug there for that. So let's move on from the currency topic and talk about number three, there's not enough Bitcoin to go around. So let's drill in a little bit. So first of all, you guys all know my Bitcoin supply chart where I talk about the fact that the world is fighting over 3.1 million coins because a lot of it's in cold storage. Over 4.03 million coins have been lost. Satoshi lockup is about 1.04 million coins. You've got all the treasuries grabbing Bitcoin as quickly as they can and on and on. And the number of coins and exchanges is depleting rapidly. It's now under two and a half million, many say. So net net. And I've got a big update to my coin uh, numbers as well for you all, because you keep on asking, what's the update? What's the update? And how many Bitcoin do I need to be in the 1%? So that's coming very soon, just finishing up some numbers. So that's the Bitcoin supply update. So yes, it is scant and it is scary. So you could argue, yes. Now, looking at another staggering way, if you look at the number of PayPal users on Earth, there are 361 million PayPal users. Okay, for those of you who invest in PayPal, that's a substantial customer base. There's not many American banks that have even close to that. Now, if you calculate the number of Bitcoins per PayPal user, by my math today, it's 0.0. .0 four Bitcoins per PayPal user, which is staggering. And again, it, it basically reinforces the scarcity of this asset like nothing ever before. But let's turn it around and talk about a different way of looking at 
Bitcoin, we need to look at it in terms of Satoshis. So in terms of the number of Satoshis per PayPal user, that's a different story. There's over 4 million Satoshis per PayPal user. And again, that's a very good starting block for anybody who wants to think about Bitcoin. Okay, so 0.04 Bitcoin can get you started down the path to becoming uh, wealthy and safe and secure in the future. So I just want to share that with everybody. So yeah, it's not scarce. It's divisible by 100 million each Bitcoin. And just look at that. So you, I could also run the numbers for every single person on Earth, which I will at the end in terms of Satoshis. So the next argument is Bitcoin is deflationary, therefore it's bad. So let's look at this argument a little bit. Uh, first of all, yes, on the surface, deflation is good, but it pushes people to avoid spending. Now, let me give you an example of that. Imagine you have one Bitcoin and you put your life savings into it and you just bought it for $56,000 or $62,000, whatever. The question is, would you trade that Bitcoin in for a Tesla right now? And the answer is, if you are in any way smart, unless you have thousands of Bitcoins, you're not, you're gonna hold on to it. And this can lead to a vicious cycle of decreasing prices and wages because people will not spend their Bitcoin. So yes, this is the deflationary argument that some people will use that's actually bad. But let's look at the corollary. So deflation, good or bad? Now the question is, is inflation good or bad? Let's turn it around. Which is the lesser of the two evils, deflation or inflation? So obviously Bitcoiners reject inflation. Uh, Bitcoiners believe it represents an aggressive, silent tax, slowly siphoning wealth away from the average person to the politically well-connected, those people that are tied into the big money supplies, the big banks, and can fill their own pockets first. So from that perspective, inflation is definitely not good. And deflation, well, let's go a little bit deeper as usual. So first of all, Bitcoin does actually inflate. It's engineered to do that, albeit very gradually over time. And you've all seen this chart in my videos before, and it does increase. And the number of Bitcoin minted every 10 minutes is always there as well. So just keep that in mind. However, it is reducing over time. And also you could argue that people, because when they self custody, they lose their coins. And that's causing a bit of a problem as well. So yeah, that actual supply is going down. And that's why I say there'll never be more than 14 million Bitcoin. So let's look at the other argument. So Bitcoin supply is not deflationary. Yes, it's monetary supply is programmed to be one thing that's constant. So I think from my perspective, as the world coalesces around a Bitcoin standard, it'll stabilize the world. There could be less wars. There will be less inflation. And there'll be even less deflation caused by excessive money printing that happens right now. So hopefully all that will become a thing of the past and Bitcoin will bring about more discipline on the part of the central banks around the world. We'll see, but it's just a theory. So not worried about it being deflationary. I hope I debunked that one as well. Now, next one, number five, Bitcoin is not a productive asset. Let's look into this one real carefully. So first of all, what drives asset value? So in economics, an asset has value if it has two things. One, scarce, and two, utility. Well, <laughs> we just covered the scarcity. And yeah, check, Bitcoin is very scarce. And utility, well, it is a store of value. It can be used as a mechanism by which to make payments and transfer money faster, more efficient than any other mechanism out there. So yes, it has lots of utility. Therefore, it has value. You can't say it doesn't. Now let's look at Michael Saylor and how he describes it. Now, Bitcoin is a masterpiece of monetary energy. But what he says is once you understand this energy, that Bitcoin is a monetary energy network, then you can appreciate exactly how it runs and how it doesn't leak based on the laws of thermodynamics. And that's very important. So consider things like inflation being a leak. You have $100 today, a month from now, you've got $98. A month after that, you've got $96.5, et cetera. That's exactly what's happening now with the 15% inflation. And as I always say, go to the supermarket and look at the price of blueberries go up by a dollar every couple of months, like clockwork. Anyway, 
that's that piece. And finally, what does monetary energy look like? So today, coincidentally, we had a record number of exahashes for the hash rate for Bitcoin. And what that basically means is the security of the actual protocol. And it's locked down. So just so people understand how many, what this actually means, is one tera hash is a trillion hashes per second. These are like calculations done by all the miners and all the computers and the whole network. One peta hash is a quadrillion hashes per second. And one exahash, okay, is one quintillion hashes per second. When I was a kid, I didn't even believe quintillion was a word. I thought it was a made-up word, but it is actually a real word. It's one plus 18 zeros. And we hit 200 of those today per second. That's what monetary energy looks like. And that is the value of Bitcoin. So don't listen to anybody when they say it doesn't have any value. Okay. Number six, scarcity is an illusion. Let's dig into this a little bit. So Bitcoin can be replaced by other altcoins because people say, yeah, there's not enough to go around. So some other altcoin will come in and do that. So there are over 5,098 altcoins at the time of this recording in existence. And none have ever gotten close to unseating the king. And again, as always, Bitcoin is the biggest, it's the most secure, it's the most decentralized, it's the most accepted, it's the most mainstream, and it's the most anonymous of all cryptocurrencies. Okay, so will Bitcoin be unseated? No. Could something like Ethereum have a greater market for capitalization? Possibly because of the about a, the interruption that they're going to bring to the financial services industry. So that is definitely a possibility, but stay tuned for that. In the meantime, Bitcoin will only increase in value over time. So in conclusion, as always, thank you all for sticking to the end. It's always the best part before we wrap everything up. Two very short conclusions. As I teased at the beginning, think Satoshi as a unit of account. Don't think in terms of, oh, I need to have a whole Bitcoin because the reality is not many people can afford $62,000 or by the end of this weekend, it could be $65,000 again. Who knows? But if you look at the number of Satoshis in existence, based on the amount of Bitcoin out there per my calculation, you get about that number, which is massive. It's basically 100 million times 18 million. And you divide that by the 7.8 billion humans on Earth. That means there is 166,000 sats per person out there. So everybody on Earth could technically have 166,000 hashes. But as a teaser for my upcoming video, the amount of Bitcoin to be in the 1%, you'll see that because big high net worth individuals and treasuries, they are grabbing coin fast. That 166,000 per person is no longer a possibility. Not even close to that. But at the same time, anybody can get a Satoshi or a thousand Satoshis, 10,000 Satoshis, 100,000 Satoshis, whatever the case may be. And people should strive to start sucking some away and keeping them for that rainy day. As uh, Shamath puts it, he calls it schmuck insurance. So it's a good thing to have. Now, Bitcoin is a unit of account. Another piece of food for thought, just to give you an idea of how undervalued this monetary system is the s p 500 today is valued at about 493 million bitcoin okay now that's a lot of bitcoin but there's only 2.3 million bitcoin left on the exchanges so investors really need to start thinking what this actually means and what this true scarcity means okay as usual that's a wrap. Big thank you to everyone on Patreon. And uh, <laughs> you guys actually drove a lot of these questions. And all these FUD type questions came from many of you many times over. And uh, if you like this content, hit like and subscribe. And thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Talk to you tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Watch for scammers as well. We have a service now uh, in the comments deleting them, but they still sneak in every now and again. And this is a great video, actually, of a guy that calls up one of these scammers. And you could see how contrived it is. So don't call anybody. Don't respond to any emails. Everybody's out for your money. Be careful. Be paranoid. 
don't trust anybody unless you can see them face to face. That should be your test. Unless you can see them, talk to them, kick their tires, do not talk to anybody and do not give anybody anything. Thanks everybody. Bye.